Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. Today, I'll share an All-America Selection eggplant. Dennis Martin addresses our turf grass and this drought. We then travel to Tulsa to learn about why, as gardeners, it's also important we protect ourselves from the summer sun. I'll show you an interesting twist on two favorite vegetables. Finally, we head south to a colorful cut flower farm. If you haven't tried planting eggplant in the garden, it's a fun plant to plant, so I'd highly suggest it. It is in the family with tomatoes and peppers, so you want to make sure to rotate it um, and put it in a different location than where maybe you've had those previously planted. Now, we've featured eggplant on Oklahoma Gardening before, um, and a lot of times when people think of eggplant, they think of those large, deep purple fruit. However, um, we have a white eggplant and like I said, we've actually even featured the white one, a Japanese uh, variety before. But today we're featuring a new selection that was an All-America um, winner for 2022 and this is known as Icicle. Now, eggplant originally got its name because of the white fruit that looks like eggs hanging on a plant. Um, but this icicle variety is going to be a little bit longer and more cylindrical than some of the smaller, rounder um, white eggplants that you might have grown previously. Now this particular variety does not sacrifice the taste or the texture, so you're still gonna get that same great taste and texture, but it also is not have as many spines on it. So when you're harvesting, it's not gonna be as painful to get in there and get those fruit. Now, icicle will get tall. It'll get about 48 inches tall. And so you might wanna provide it with a little bit of support because as it gets more of those fruits on there, it's gonna get a heavier. And of course, we know in Oklahoma, we have some really strong winds. Now, the height on this is a little deceiving because of our raised bed here, um, but actually our soil sunk down. Um, and so it's growing a little bit further, probably about a foot down than what it appears as the top of this bed. Um, but actually that kind of just supports it along the sides of the bed there. So we've got a rather tall plant here um, and you can see we've got several different um, fruits that are growing in here. We've got two plants. We've got another one back here um, that has several long ones that are starting to develop as well. They have these nice purple flowers that kind of look like what you might find in the Solanaceae family. Um, these are purple uh, that kind of remind you of maybe the, the nettle that you see out in the wild. Um, but again, this one is the edible uh, eggplant. So when you harvest this, you wanna make sure that you are using pruners um, and not actually just twisting the fruit off. This one actually got stuck between two branches and so it kind of pinched the bottom half of this fruit. The other nice thing about icicles is a lot of times when we have these white fruit, they will start to brown a little bit once they are cut. Um, but icicle tends to hold its uh, true white color a little bit longer than some of the other varieties. So if you're looking for an eggplant to add in your garden, you might try icicle. We're deep into another drought in Oklahoma, high temperatures and about 41 days of uh, time period with very little to no rain throughout much of the state. Many people have been diligently caring for their warm season grass lawns for a number of weeks and they may be either tiring or your community may be telling you you've got to cut back on water. Well, if you've used Bermuda grass or buffalo grass, we want to tell you you're in one of the best situations to cooperate with that reduced watering regime. Some people may even choose to 
completely quit watering those two turf grasses. And we want to bring some comfort to the situation because if you've picked Bermuda grass or buffalo grass, you've picked the two warm season perennial grass species that have some of the best heat tolerance and drought tolerance in existence. There is something called summer drought dormancy where water availability in the, in the soil becomes so limiting that the turf grasses such as Bermuda, buffalo, and others actually fire their leaves. Leaf firing is when the leaves uh, turn bluish gray first, they wilt, and then in the presence of strong sunlight, the UV wavelengths actually break down the pigments in the leaves. And then you see the tan color of the cellulose, hemicellulose, and the lignin that's in the leaves. Actually, I think it's quite attractive straw brown color. Well, in this segment, we talk about the ability of buffalo grass and Bermuda grass if they haven't been too negatively affected by diseases, insects, or actually over fertilization with nitrogen. Uh, they should be able to handle this summer drought dormancy and come back when uh, rains return either in summer or in the fall. Now I'm standing at the interface of a common Bermuda grass area and a prestige buffalo grass. You can see a few uh, green shoots still uh, in the Bermuda grass and in the buffalo grass, but they're largely firing off. And this is uh, a concern if we had over fertilized them or if we'd had a lot of insect or disease damage that would have compromised their ability uh, to conduct water in their tissues and go into dormancy. But in this particular area, we didn't have grub issues, we didn't have fall army worm or hunting billbug injury. So we're very confident about the performance that we're gonna get out of this particular area. So you always need to scout for uh, insect injury. A little injury is okay, but excess, of course, can be a problem. And uh, we wanna keep a cutting height somewhere in the range of an inch and a half to three inches for these two species uh, in lawns. Uh, we wanna make sure we don't over fertilize buffalo grass. So that's gonna be a one pound to a maximum of three pounds uh, active ingredient nitrogen per thousand square foot. For Bermuda grass, similar range, but don't exceed four pounds of nitrogen per thousand. When this drought is over with, we're gonna pull some cores. We're gonna show you where uh, the new green shoots came from, and that'll teach us about the value of underground stems called rhizomes in the case of Bermuda grasses, and just sheer drought tolerance in the case of buffalo grasses. So don't fret. Your Bermuda grass and your buffalo grass can stand a certain amount of summer drought dormancy and then come back once the rains resume. When thinking about turf type cover for shady areas, many people think about tall fescues, Kentucky bluegrasses, and perennial ryegrasses. But I'd like to also mention the ability to use Carex sedges. Carex is a genus. Remember, as we scientifically classify plants, we talk about the genus and species name. Well, Carex is a genus, a very large genus of sedges. And when we talk about sedges, people oftentimes think of them as being weeds, but there's many valuable plants within the Carex genus. We can use Carex species members such as Leavenworth sedge, Amphibola sedge, Texas sedge, and even Pennsylvania sedge as a turf type ground cover in Oklahoma. Now, three of those species, all but Pennsylvania sedge, are naturally found in Oklahoma. And even the Pennsylvania sedge, which is found in the eastern U.S., is commercialized and you can buy plug flat trays of it and plant it as plugs. Here at the Botanic Garden at OSU, for many years, we've had wonderful members of the Carrick species in our shaded areas here on the grounds. In fact, other turf professors and myself over the years have actually killed some of these sedges out and we've tried to install tall fescue. Well, the fescue died either during uh, disease-prone periods of heavy rainfall or drought-type conditions like we're seeing now in Oklahoma, and the sedges came back from seed that was already present in the soil. So it's hard to beat something that wants to live and come back and form a, a nice, dense turf cover. The OSU team is actually working to develop improved turf-type Carrick sedges, both available from plugs and seed in the future, but in the meantime, Commercial industry already has a plug flat trays of these species available to you. In fact, if you've ever visited the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, you've seen an area 
of Texas sedge that's been talked about uh, in a dry shade there. Well, we have a mix of the Carrick sedge species here, and I'd like to point them out to you at this time. So actually we have uh, cart traffic for horticulturalists serving the various parts of the botanic garden. And so in the, the fore area here, we actually have cart traffic on these Carrick sedges that are here. Uh, to my left is a non-trafficked area. And this area is mowed anywhere uh, from once a week to once every two weeks, depending on how tall the sedges get, but also it's kept in about a one and a half to three inch cutting height range. Now sedges, the Carrick sedges have short rhizomes, so they're not going to produce a really long rhizome like Bermuda grass, and they don't form an above ground stem called a stolon, they form the below ground stem call, called a rhizome. They spread horizontally through a little bit of throwing of seed, but also largely through the rhizomes turning up and they'll form a clump that you see here. And these clumps are not unlike the clumps that you see uh, with tall fescues. Now, the sedges are slow growing, but they are heat tolerant, drought tolerant, and very cold tolerant. And they're found throughout the US. They do need watering and fertilization during establishment but you can withdraw those resources as you get them to maturity. So don't just think of tall fescues, bluegrasses, and ryegrasses for set, uh, shade. Think about a carrick sedge and its ability to tolerate incredible heat and drought at maturity. When a lot of people hear ketchup and fries, you're probably thinking something along this lines, not something like this that's out in your garden. Well, every spring when we're going through those catalogs too, sometimes we find some of those novelty plants that we just can't help but try as well, including this tomato that's called ketchup and fries. Now it has that name because it's actually a tomato that is grafted onto a potato which makes sense. They're both in the same plant family. Now, I was a little surprised when we got these in. They were very tiny plants early this spring and the rootstock, which is the potato, had a much smaller stem than the stem of the tomato. So I was a little leery as to whether they were gonna make it or not. But as you can see, we have three plants that have successively taken off out here this summer. And we are getting some nice cherry tomatoes on top. Now, the thing, if you're into horticulture and you realize this, tomatoes are a warm season crop, whereas potatoes here in Oklahoma, we plant those as a cool season crop. So I'm a little um, skeptical about how well our potatoes are gonna do after being out here all summer long. Um, and I will admit, we kind of did this a little different than what uh, they say to do. Um, and that is, you're actually supposed to plant the graft down into the ground. Typically when you have a graft union, you want that graft union to be above the soil so that you don't allow that scion or that upper growth to root itself. The idea here is to go ahead and let the tomato root itself so that it, you have that rootstock growing as well. So if you look here, we've got our potato growing underneath. And in fact, we even have some potato suckers that have started to come up and we've got the nice cherry tomatoes on top. And right here is that graft union. And in fact, we do have the hint that there are a couple of potatoes that are being produced down there if you kind of dig around. So we're gonna wait till a little later in the season before we actually harvest this. Now, what it suggests is to, when your season starts to slow down, go ahead and trim off your tomatoes and ripen any ones that might still be pink and allow those to ripen and then harvest your potatoes. So we're gonna give it a little more time before we actually go after those potatoes and see what's underneath there. So in the meantime, we're still enjoying our delicious cherry tomatoes and I'll report back later in the season to see if we have any fries to go along with our ketchup. As you can tell today, we are not in a garden. We are actually over here at the Tandy Medical Building. And joining me is Dr. Chronister. Dr. Chronister, thank you so much for having Absolutely. us here. Absolutely. So 
people are probably wondering, what is a gardening show doing here in a medical facility? But I wanted to talk to you specifically about gardeners and the sun exposure that they might get. Oh, yes. It's, it's extreme this year. It is extreme, and the heat's extreme as well, as well as the humidity. It, absolutely. So, And those can affect our body differently. Like, we could have some lower temperatures, but that humidity can really impact us. Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So when we, th I think a lot of us know what it feels like to be in the heat, right? Mm -hmm. And that our bodies need a lot of water. We can talk about hydration here in a minute, but whenever we're in the heat, we, we lose a lot more water quickly, right? Okay. However, when we're in the humidity, it creates that kind of stickiness, you know, as opposed to just that, that, um, the sweat drying off of you, which is exactly what you need to cool off. Right. When it feels we, like a, you got a rag over your face. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And when we think about like sports clothing, we always see stuff that's like water wicking. Uh -huh. Well, because we don't want that water to stay on us because the longer that water stays on that, on us and the stickier we are, actually that, that water heats up and it's harder to overcome. Okay. So our body actually has to work a lot harder to cool us down in that sticky, hum humid temperatures. Okay. So while it might be great for plants, it's not so good on gardeners. It is not so great on gardeners. <laughs> No. So let's talk, we hear a lot about heat stress and heat stroke. Kind of go through some of those um, symptoms that we might see and yeah. what we need to do. So both are actually very common. And I think a lot of times people have had heat stroke and they didn't even recognize what it was or what was happening to them. Uh -huh. So when we're talking about that heat exhaustion, that's a feeling of just kind of fatigue. Okay. And I always describe it as the, like, you feel like you're moving through mud a little bit and you think, oh, I just must be tired. You might start having some muscle cramps. You might have a little bit of a headache we might get kind of lightheaded when you've been down in the plants and then you stand back up and right. go, ooh, getting a little lightheaded. That's when you're getting that heat exhaustion. Okay. Now, when we've moved into heat stroke, it is that throbbing headache, often nausea, vomiting. Um, our, our heart rate is going very, very quickly and temperature is quite high. So we're talking temperatures about 103 okay. because our bodies can't control it. So it's very important that that person gets cooled down. If at any point someone loses consciousness during that, you need to get them to a hospital. Okay. If you know that you're going to be outside and you know you plan to be out in your garden today, then how about we start planning for that in advance? Okay. So starting two hours in advance, but up to 30 minutes in advance, how about we start drinking some water? I would love for someone to get in about four cups of water before they even go outside. Okay. About every 15 to 20 minutes that they're outside, make sure you're getting another cup of water in. Right. Now, if you are in the sun and you are actively sweating for more than an hour, but definitely by the hour and a half point, you're starting to not only lose water, but you're losing some of those electrolytes. So that's when it's important to bring in some of those um, replacement drinks. You know, we think Gatorade, Powerade, but there's a lot of ones on the market now. Wearing good sunscreen is important. Okay. I recommend at least an SPF 30 okay. to make sure that you're getting enough sun protection. Anything lower than that, you might not get be getting the anti-cancer benefits. Okay. And are there any areas that, you know, we should really be more cautious of that might be exposed that we might overlook sometimes? Absolutely. So when we're thinking about that sun exposure, we're thinking things that are hit most with the sun. Uh -huh. So if Tops you, of your shoulders, tops right? Tops of your if shoulders. Yeah. Scalp if you okay. don't have hair, um, tops of eyebrows, but really your eyes are pretty well protected. So then we're talking about our cheeks okay. here, our nose, because there's no, there's nothing it's covering that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we're, we're talking really our, our foreheads, our noses, our cheeks, our tops of our ears, and our chest okay. as well. That is getting that direct sun um, that we really need to make sure that we are covering with a wide brim hat and some sunscreen. All right. Well, I think that really covers a lot of it. And of course, if there's any, any concern, somebody should go see a dermatologist, of course. Absolutely. And some some primary care doctors are able to easily evaluate um, lesions and treat in the office as well, but it's it's whoever can best treat it for you. Right. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Absolutely. Conister. Appreciate it. Today we are at Pedal Pusher Farms just outside of Washington, Oklahoma. And joining me is one of the owners, Jarrah Irby. Jarrah, you and your husband Matt started this a few years ago and it's a cut flower farm. Why cut flowers? <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for coming. Yeah, my husband and I, we really love flowers. And as a forester and him as soil scientist, we decided back in 2017 to quit mowing this area. <laughs> you didn't have enough flowers in your life. <laughs> we needed more flowers. So we started putting flowers in the ground out here. Mm -hmm. So um, we grow on a little less than an acre and we grow pretty much year round from spring to summer and then into the fall. So 
We're standing in our summer annual field right now with these beautiful giant African marigolds. They are beautiful and very long stems, perfect for cut flowers. Perfect. So there's so much to talk about and you kind of mentioned you go year round. Yes. And being a cut flower, I would suspect succession planting is important. 100%, yeah. So we usually start seeds in the spring for our summer cut annuals, but then we also plant all the way up until probably July 1st for the fall. Okay. And then back, coming back into the, the early spring season, we'll start planting um, in our tunnels. So yeah. yeah, all about successions. So what, who comes out here and gets this? Is, is it available for anybody to come out and cut or farmers markets? Tell me kind of where yeah. you're selling this and offering it to people. Yeah. So we are an agritourism site. Okay. And so we have events that are already scheduled for this season. Um, you can find all those events on our website and purchase a ticket to come out to do our UPICs. Okay. And so we have a couple different options, our traditional evening you picks where you come out you get a bucket a pair of snips and you can come cut on all of our flowers and then we help you design a hand tied bouquet okay and then we also have our floral arrangement classes where you get to come out and you pick a uh -huh. course and then I walk you through how to design a arrangement in a different type of vessel that we have okay. um, and then our other event is called our date night event which is really fun we partner with our friends at OKC Grays um, um, folks come out, do a you pick, of course, <laughs> and then get a graze box, sit on um, our beautiful lawn, and then listen to our really amazing, talented friend Grant sing. So it's just a really amazing opportunity to come out, experience a working cut flower yeah. farm, get some local blooms, and enjoy some quiet country air. So let's get into a little bit of the meat of this cut flower farm, because I know it's easy to romanticize the idea of just throwing out seeds and watching them grow and you pick them later, but it's a lot more than that. You mentioned sure. su succession planting, um, but how do you know what does well in Oklahoma? Because there's a lot of other cut flower farms that maybe are growing different plants than what we can do here in Oklahoma. Right, yeah. So when we decided to um, start this farm, the first thing that we wanted to do was know what our soils could produce, mm -hmm. right? So getting that soil test was so important to know what kind of nutrients that um, these flowers were gonna need. And so then we thought about all right, if we're going to do cut flowers, what plants are going to do well in our Oklahoma heat? Because <laughs> we all know how hot it's been. Um, and then what plants are we going to use that will give us the most bang for our buck? Right. So we like branching plants, things that you can cut and then it'll shoot out two new stems for multiple blooms throughout the season. So actually when your visitors come and cut, they're actually doing you a yeah. service in the <laughs> exactly. sense of creating more flower buds. Right. So we've got some traditional zinnias, marigolds. Let's talk about some of the others that you have. Yeah. Um, status? Like I wouldn't have thought of status growing right. in Oklahoma. Oh yeah, we grow status, multiple colors of status, and we love status, especially because we can cut it and then if we don't use it in an arrangement or we don't sell it, on a wholesale um, order, we can save it and we can dry it and use it for a dried bouquet or even uh, during our winter months, we do reef classes. People okay. love to use that on their reefs as okay. well. And I suspect the coxcombs, maybe you can do that as well? Or? Yes, for sure. That chief mix has the most vibrant colors when they're dried. Okay. So yeah, it's a great, great cut flower to use. Well, it's a beautiful setting out here and you sure know how to grow your flowers. Um, what would you say to somebody who you know has thought about maybe dabbling in this a little bit? Do you have any advice for somebody? <laughs> yeah, I would say you, need, you have to invest in your education. Uh -huh. I mean, like you mentioned, it is just a beautiful place, um, but there's a lot of work behind it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're members of the Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers. Mm -hmm. They are a great resource to um, use whenever you have questions. Um, they provide a lot of webinars um, on how to grow cut flowers. Um, and then there's tons of books out there that you can really dive into to learn um, proper post-harvesting techniques. A lot, especially the zinnias too, they have to be harvested at a certain time. And so you have to know all those things and um, these resources will show you and teach you how to do that. Okay, all right. And and I would imagine pest control might be a thing that you have to deal with too, right? Sure, yeah. You've well, got some chickens running around. I yeah. think they're taking some of those insects away. But. We do, we love our chickens, especially for those grasshoppers this time of year and they love them too, um, but we try 
try to also use um, very little chemical. If we do use chemical, it's mostly an organic biological that we're, we're spraying because we want these flowers to be as beautiful as they are. Well, Jared, it looks like your plants are doing quite well and you've got a good crop coming this fall as well. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Thanks for coming out. Thanks. There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. For the next two weeks, OETA will be doing fundraising, but join us right back here on August 27th with another great show as we kick off our regional tour. To ride a bull for eight seconds. <laughs> oh, look at that. Good job. One more, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Tulsa Garden Center at Woodward Park, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, Smart Pot, and the Tulsa Garden Club. 